Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to Jeremy Scott Fitness Podcast Radio Show. Coming to you on this Friday afternoon with the December Q&A episode request via Instagram, email, Twitter, Tumblr, and everywhere we get messages in between. So hopefully you're having an amazing Friday. It currently is December the 13th. Friday the 13th, to be exact. So if you guys are into that stuff... Uh, beware of black cats and walking under ladders and whatever other weird superstitions people uh, tend to believe in. I uh, personally don't subscribe to those, so I'll be doing all my normal routine today. But I wanted to get to the list of questions. I have a ton from you guys. Uh, admittedly, uh, I'm too lazy to look through them beforehand, so I'm just going to kind of read them as they come in. If there's some repeats, I'll just scroll past them, uh, and hopefully I have enough expertise to speak on these. And if not... I'll refer it out and make it its own podcast if it is too detailed to tackle. So let's start off with question number one, training for first responders. Um, honestly, I guess the, probably the biggest uh, dilemma you guys have is scheduling. Uh, we have a handful of people in our groups who are uh, you know, firefighters, uh, EMTs. Uh, we have ER doctors and a lot of people who have the erratic schedules. I would say for you guys, obviously, if you're like a firefighter or something, most of them that we work with have the equipment at the fire station, at they're there, and just really programming the days that you're not working, making those your solidified, whether those be loading days or your hiking days, swimming days, biking days, depending on obviously whatever your goal is in terms of, you know, what you're trying to accomplish, and really just, you know, kind of mapping out your day best you can and really being mindful of when you're going to train, how you're going to train, what the workouts are going to look like. Um, but really, I would say the days you're not working, those are the solidified days you're going to get specific things done. And obviously, the days that you're, you know, at the firehouse or you're on your job or your schedule's a little bit of erratic, you just you really just squeeze in what you can. I guess that'd be my best advice uh, right off the top. I can bring you know some of our firefighter kind of people in, uh, EMTs and the ER people who have a little bit different schedule to, to see what they say specifically. But that's typically what we prescribe for them. Number two, any specific way. Endurance athletes should train or eat different from the average athlete. 100%. Uh, depending on you know how brutal your training is and endurance-wise, what that means. Are you you know training for an Ironman? Are you doing you know 100 mile races? Are you a marathon runner? In terms of the average athlete, I assume you just mean the couch to athlete person who gets off the couch and just comes in the gym and trains a couple times a week, which their goal is probably going to be fat loss. To me. You know, training for fat loss, training for building muscle, training for, you know, just to aesthetically look a certain way, uh, training for performance, those are all different things. And you have to eat differently, obviously, for all four of those. And depending on what type of, you know, person you are, what, what body type you have, if you're, you know, endomorph, you know, ectomorph, mesomorph, you have to eat differently as well. So the endurance people typically are going to eat um, a higher caloric diet. They're going to have to, you know, squeeze in more calories more proteins, carbs, and fats for sure, uh, just based on the amount of effort they're putting into the training. So, and obviously, what stage of training they're in? Are they getting ready for the race? Um, is it, you know, six months ahead of time, a year ahead of time? What does the, you know, training schedule look like for them? Are they gonna, you know, just have a light day today? Are they gonna have, you know, a 150, you know, mile bike ride today? That all matters. Uh, so again, yes, the eating is going to differ drastically uh, from person to person, depending on what they're doing. And obviously, you know, when you're eating for performance, you're eating to accomplish a goal. So you need the amount of food to get the goal done. It's like when I hiked the Grand Canyon, I always use that as an example, rim to rim to rim. That's the longest endurance thing I've done. You know, something, you know, straight breakneck movement for, you know, 10, 11 hours in a row uh, at like a 40% incline where you want to blow your brains out now that I think about it again. Um, I started to kind of bonk out because I couldn't consume enough calories in the short amount of time allotted. Not that I didn't want to, I just, if I, it would be too much digestive stress for me. And I, again, I don't train that way. I don't ever work out for 10 hours in a row. So that was something different for me. So the nutrition part of it plays a huge role. It's the same thing like if you do an Ironman, right? Like what they prescribe, like if it takes you, let's say 12 hours to do an Ironman, right? Or 11 hours to do an Ironman, that's how many rest days you should take after that. So if you're going to you know, do all that hard ass workload in that 12 hour time frame. you would take 12 days to rest. So obviously the eating, the rest, the recovery, all those things matter depending on what your goal is. Next one, is it okay to be in a calorie deficit all year round but have a cheat day on Saturdays? If your goal is fat loss, for sure. And I would recommend you guys eating some stuff you like every week for sure as well. 
Um, depending on you know, how quick you want to reach your goals and how drastic you want it to be, as long as that Saturday isn't so big of a cheat day, quote unquote, that it puts you in a surplus for all the other days. So meaning if you're at a calorie deficit for six days of the week at a 200 calorie deficit, at, on a, let's say 2,000 you know, calorie is maintenance. So you're eating, at, you're eating 1,800 calories and 2,000 would be your maintenance. So you're 200 under all six days, but on the seventh day, you eat 7,000 calories. Well, now you just went to a surplus for all seven days. You see where I'm saying there? Like you guys think of it day to day, which is correct. But also when you look at the macro picture, the scope of those seven days, did that one day put you over the edge for the other six days? And I think for a lot of people, that's the problem they run into. Most people eat, you know, who are, become educated and start to care about what they look like and move like and feel like, will eat really well for like five days. And then they kind of tank it for the two days. The problem is, Sometimes they go so bonkers on those two days, it really messes up every other day and it puts them into a surplus or at least puts them back at maintenance and that stalls their you know, weight loss or fat loss depending on what the goal may be. So yes, I think it's okay, but really just tracking the macros, being mindful of it, using my fitness pal is easy to do. And then if you're gonna say, you know, the hell with it one day, then just go that route and uh, you know, see where the, the calories fall and kind of go from there. Next one. How to deal with unsupportive spouse, um, contest prep, and fitness in general. So uh, if the question, I'm reading it correctly, how to deal with unsupportive spouse and you're trying to do a contest or compete. Uh, that's a tough one, man, because you're when you're competing, you're, you're being super selfish and not, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I did it for many years. Uh, but your spouse does pay the price. My wife paid the price for it and I think I you know, handled it better than most people. I do believe I handle certain stresses and uh, being hungry and tired and those things better than the average human. I, I can just endure a little bit more than, you know, the person next door. Maybe that's just my gift or maybe I'm just too stupid to, to, to realize what's going on. But um, as good as I could be, there was days where I would be hangry and just tired and I couldn't be a social and um, she had to put up with it. The difference in my life was there was an end game to it. Uh, there was a monetary, you know, benefit to it for her. It was moving my business along. It was getting me, you know, distribution. It was getting me, you know, reach and attention that I wasn't going to get if I didn't do it. So she was willing to put up with it for a short amount of time. Um, but if it's just fitness in general, if your husband or wife or brother, sister, mom, dad, friends, family aren't supportive of you being healthier and working out and eating right, um, you have to have a talk with them or you just have to ignore them and really just, you know, put them to the side or just be completely honest with them. Be like, hey guys, Here's my goals and here's what I want to do. If you don't support it, you know, fuck it. I don't really give a shit if you guys care or not. I'm going to do this either way. And just over time, I think people will just start to understand that's who you are. They'll start to gravitate towards you, especially when they can see the results. For a lot of people in the beginning, they're not going to do it for the fact of like they can't see the changes yet. And they see you putting in so much time, effort, and energy, but they're not seeing the progress, the results. They might not see the weights going up in the gym. They might not see the you know, idiosyncrasies of your physique changing over time, a, a crease here, a cut here, the body fat goes down, you lost seven pounds. They didn't notice it yet. But give it you know, six months, give it nine months, give it 12 months, give it 18 months. When you show up and you look like a different person, they'll be like, holy shit. They'll tend to be not only supportive, but they're also now gonna ask you for advice and for help because you have now become the expert because you're you know, leading from the front, if you will. You're walking the walk and talking the talk. Uh, but at first it can be tough. It can be difficult and all I can tell you is just stay the course man If you really believe in what you're doing um, Just do it to the best of your ability and do it with a great attitude and if it's contest prep and stuff Don't be don't take it out on other people that you're hangry and tired and you're pissed and don't complain to them about it And don't tell them about it because you're choosing to do it. No one's making you step on stage No one's making you compete. No one's making you you know drop body fat No one's making you work out and eat a certain way. You're doing it to yourself. So do it with a smile or we say suffer in silence, you know, just like, you know, smile, grit your teeth and just kind of bear it. And uh, no, it's going to pay off in the future, even if you can't see the promise just yet. I know it will. And people will gravitate towards you. And the ones who don't, you're just going to leave them behind, man. And I'm not saying they don't have to be your friends, especially if you're, you're married to them and they're, you know, in your family. But they just go into it. That's why I say there's levels of friends I have, right? Like all my friends have different levels and they're in different buckets. And some of them are my fitness friends. Some of them are the friends I grew up with. Some of them are my criminal friends, you know, your drinking friends, all these different people that they're all in different blocks. And you have different conversations with different groups of people. I think you guys all experience that. 
Uh, and if they're really not on board with you eating healthy and being active, um, if you're not willing to have the honest conversation with them and just say, hey guys, you know, why are you so against me working out every day? Why are you so against me eating a certain way? How does it affect you? Um, there's always drink pushers and food pushers. And as long as you're not, you know, trying to push your lifestyle on them, as long as you're not trying to make them work out and make them not drink and make them eat the way that you eat, I think you're justified in just kind of doing your own thing. That's one thing about people that always say, well, you know, when we go out to dinner with, with certain people, not our close friends, because they know who I am at this point and what I do, like, well, what's Jeremy going to eat? Or, you know, or they'll say something as they order. Well, I'm going to order this, Jeremy, but it's not healthy. Like, let me say this to you. I don't give a shit what you guys eat. I do not care what you guys eat. I do not care what you drink. I do not care if you choose to work out. I would like you to eat healthier. I'd like you to make better drinking choices. I'd like you to be active every single day, but you're all grown adults. Like, I don't stay up at night worrying about what my friends and family are eating and drinking. That's on them. I'll do the best that I can to present and educate and just lead from the front, but it's on those guys. I don't push health and fitness on anybody, not my wife, not the people who work with me and for me. Um, that's on you guys. Next one, do one about panic attacks and not to worry. Man, uh, I've never had like a panic attack, although I feel like every time my CPA and financial advisor and like attorney get on the phone together, I have a panic attack. For surely when my CPA calls and I see Chris's number call my phone, this like just cold sweat of panic washes over me and my heart goes to about, you know, a million beats a second. And I just, I know it's never gonna be any good news. He's never gonna call me and say, hey Jeremy, I found an error. You, we have an extra $300,000 for you. It's usually not that, it's usually like, hey man, you owe, and you owe a lot more than you thought. Uh, but uh, in all seriousness, I've never really had a panic attack like that. I, I don't know how to explain that to you. My wife has had some uh, kind of claustrophobic moments and some other moments I can bring her on and maybe we can chat about it. But the to not worry thing, what I would say is this, you just have to really focus on controlling what you can control in life and let the rest of the shit go. And are we, are any of us really immune to that? I don't think so. I think there's always gonna be stuff that bothers us. There's a lot of things that don't bother me that bother probably all of you guys listening. And I just really don't give a fuck, man, about so much stuff because it's just, it's comical how, you know, insignificant 99% of the stuff we deal with every day really is. And I don't mean to say that like your life isn't important, but who really gives a shit? Like if the backsplash in your house isn't perfect, who really cares if your grass isn't the greenest grass in the neighborhood? Who cares if your car is red and you wanted a blue one? Like, does that really matter in the scope of your life? It doesn't. Um, does it really matter if you get fired from your job? I guess it does, but there's there's a ton of other jobs out there. It's not like you're never gonna find one. Like, it doesn't matter if you don't get a perfect 4.0 GPA in school. I think at this point we've established like your GPA means absolutely nothing to your importance on this planet. So I just tend to not worry about the insignificant stupid things. Now, I say this all the time, like if my house burned down tomorrow, um, would I cry? No, I wouldn't. It would suck because there's some things in there that I can't replace, like you know, personal memorabilia from my childhood and from college and from friends and from my wife and memories that we've shared. But I have insurance. I can buy another house. I don't give a shit. Now, if my entire like website went down and every blog post and every video and every podcast and all our clients' transformation, if all that stuff disappeared, I probably would cry for the fact that I put blood, sweat, and tears into that, and it means something to me beyond, you know, materialistic things. It's it's kind of like my life's work of helping other people. So that would be hard for me, and I would worry about how could I get it back if it could ever come back. But for the most part, I don't worry about a lot of things that I can't control. I just really try to create an ecosystem and environment in my life where I safeguard against the things that would bring me down. So. I grew up, you guys, with obviously, you know, my story with no money and nothing. And so I've basically lived my life the past 11 years to ensure that that doesn't happen, you know, for me in my life in the future and for my wife's life. And if we had a kid or something, it wouldn't happen for that kid's life. So I've given up a lot of things up front to create an ecosystem and acquire enough wealth to where I don't have to worry about money like that the rest of my life. So my answer would be, do the things that are going to put yourself in the best position to live the healthiest, happiest life possible. And so I don't worry about keeping up with the Joneses. 
I don't worry about status and title and stupid shit. All I worry about is how I feel and how can I be the happiest person I can be and how can I have the most fun of my life with the least amount of stress. That's what I try to do every fucking day. And that's why I created this business and this life and what I do because I want to enjoy my Wednesday. I want to enjoy my Sunday morning. I don't want to have anxiety and worry about stupid shit and worry about if I walk into the door, is someone going to fire me? Because they can't. Like, I'm the boss. Like, I'm the only one who's in control of that. So to answer the question, just create a life where you eliminate the worthless shit and noise. So if you have debt, I would say get rid of the debt in your life. If it's student loans, credit card loans, home loans, if it's a, it's a, a loan for your car, try to pay those off as quick as you can. Save some money for retirement. Like, do the things that make you happy. Like, find the things that you love and do tons of those. And just, you know, really spend your time doing the things that light you up. Hopefully that helps. Next one. Instead of J-Lab, is there another probiotic you recommend? Um, I do love J-Lab's probiotics. I think we do have a different one in a refrigerator at home. I'll try to put it on uh, IG, um, on my stories next time I take a uh, supplement. So, um, what is it, cruise it slow on Instagram. Shoot me a, a DM or email and I'll send you uh, a picture of all the supplements we have in our refrigerator right now. But I do like J-Lab's probiotics because I do, I think Jane and them do a really good job and I trust them that they're not gonna, you know, feed me some rat poison or some other crazy shit like some of these other people out there, so. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of great probiotics out there. I just do like those guys. And if you take Athletic Greens, um, there is a probiotic complex in there. For most of you guys, I think that's good enough because obviously, you know, if you're dumping in Athletic Greens every day, it does help support your immune system and obviously your gut health and digestion, liver function, you name it, hormone balance. So again, side note, if you guys want to try Athletic Greens, hit me up. I can send you a link for 20 free travel packs and I might even have a couple free single packs I can send you in the mail to try if you're really nervous about it, but I promise you they are the best tasting greens out there. But hit me up on either of those things and if I can help you, I for certainly will. And that would suffice as a probiotic for most of you out there. Next question. How's the response been from TikTok? Um, honestly, man, I don't even know how to use TikTok. I really don't. Honestly, I don't know how to use most of this social media stuff. I really just pump out the stuff and I interact with people best I can. And when we do corporate deals, then I look at analytics and insights and stuff. But I really, you know, I look at numbers for our business and I follow certain things. We do set goals and metrics, but I really just try to provide as much value as possible. So for TikTok, I pump out a lot of videos on there. I share them to Instagram. I follow three people, my wife, Dave D, and then one of our youth clients because she has it. And uh, that's about it, man. I really just... TikTok really confuses me, like most things in the world. Next one, abs and obliques workouts. Um, Peter G. Simply, shoot me a message. I can send you a link for 10 uh, free ab workouts that we have, videos, PDF, clickable, send it to you. You can take it with you everywhere you go. They're outside the box ab training, but uh, definitely will uh, will help you guys. Next one, what do you do after reducing calories and you have, if you lost the weight, what is the next step? So again, you've cut your calories down, and you've lost the weight, what do you do? Well, if you are at your ideal weight, I would just eat at maintenance. If you wanna keep losing, I would say keep going, and when you hit a plateau or you stall, adjust the macro slightly to be at a deficit, maybe another 100 or 200 calories below. I would say go with probably 200 calories below. And if the goal is to obviously gain size, bump those cows up, my man, and get on the gains train. Next one, fitness model aesthetics. Why are they diff on a different level than recreational lifters? Well. I'll answer this really quick. Uh, fitness models, if the type of people you're talking, if that's, if you wanna put me in that category, or if you're talking like, you know, if I even got leaner, which at this point seems, you know, to be a pain in the ass, you're training just to look a certain way. Like when I would compete in bodybuilding and physique and like men's model and that kind of crap, you're eating to look a certain way. Your performance sucks for the most part. Now, when I'm like, even leaner than this, like super, super lean, like I'm talking like starting to get like shreds in your glutes lean, um, you're weak, you're, you're the weakest you've ever been. You feel like a bag of shit, um, your lifts suck, you have no endurance, you just, you really can't. There's a, there's a breaking point for everybody where you get too lean and everything else suffers in your life because of it. You might look really good in photos, um, you don't feel good in clothes because you're like, you can't fill them out anymore if you're a dude. 
And if you're a woman and you get super lean, typically your period stops, your hair starts to thin and fall out. You just, there's a lot of damage that comes with it. Now, if you're on androgens and a certain amount of drugs, you probably can stick with it. Um, so if you do a shit ton of drugs, I guess that's probably the one exception. But to answer the question, people who train for just aesthetics don't care about performance. They don't care what their lifts are. They don't care if they can complete, you know, Metcons or hit workouts or if they can even hike a mountain or if they can even run a mile without stopping. All they care about is just to look a certain way. Now, if it's a recreational lifter, they're probably going for a mix. They want to, you know, they want to be able to do a turkey trot. They want to go do a group workout or go for a hike or do some, you know, ride a bike for, you know, two hours in a row. And they just want a nice mix. And so I did a podcast and it's called The Cost of Getting Lean. I would urge all of you guys to listen to that. And that will kind of break down the levels. It's a playoff of PN and what Berardi had put out. But the podcast is called The Cost of Getting Lean. You can Google it, Cost of Getting Lean, Jeremy Scott Fitness. It'll pop right up. It's on iTunes here too. Um, that's probably the best scenario I could give you. you. know, I'm a leaner person by nature. It's a lot of work for me to be 215, 16, 17 pounds, whatever I am today, and be this lean. I have to lift heavy enough, but not so heavy that I kill my joints and rip tendons and muscle tissue. But if I was just to do all hit and Metcon stuff, I'd probably be 190 pounds and you know paper thin shredded that would be my natural state i could live there now my lifting would suffer i probably couldn't you know deadlift as heavy or squat as heavy or split squat as heavy and i would lose a little bit of muscle size but the conditioning would improve so again that's probably the biggest difference those people are trained just to look a certain way not performance typically the bodybuilders and the physique people are they're not the strongest they're not the fittest. They couldn't, they couldn't complete an Ironman. They wouldn't be in a powerlifting competition. They're just lifting to look a certain way. And everything they eat, how they train, how they sleep, how they move is geared towards that. Everything they do is geared towards just the looks. And for most people, the juice is not worth the squeeze in that world. You have to give up a lot of stuff socially um, and mentally and emotionally for people. And honestly, a lot of the people you guys look up to in terms of that, they're on a shit ton of drugs. I'm not going to name names and I'm not going to say everybody, but there's a lot of drug use and a lot of things that go on out there in the world that people do not talk about. And it gives you unreal expectations of what is possible for you. And a lot of those people, when you see them, they don't look like that all the time. They look like that for a couple of days a year for a competition or for some photo shoots. And sometimes they live off of, you know, 10 videos and like 200 photos that they took in a five day span. The rest of the year, they look 30, 40 pounds bigger. So that's why I say never compare and just do the best you can do and, and really be confident in your goals. Next one. How do you deal with being away from home for a long time? How do you stay motivated and stay positive? Well, man, I don't venture off from home that often, so I do not know. My wife does way more than me. I don't have to travel for this life if I don't want to. Anything I travel for, I choose to do it. Um, if the opportunity fits me and what I want to do. And how do I stay motivated and positive? I have a podcast, honestly, as well, on how to stay motivated. Uh, and for me to be positive, man, my life, you know, it just used to suck shit. And now it's awesome. So I just have gratitude every single day. And I said this to Monica the other day in the office. Is it the, if this was the best it ever got for me, I, I'd be okay with it. Now, there's other things I obviously want to accomplish and do and places I want to go and different experiences I want to have. But if this is the best it got for me, like I'm this shape, um, this is the money I make and I live in Scottsdale and I'm married to my wife and these are my friends and life's pretty good, man. Of the seven, eight billion people in the world, I'm pretty fucking lucky. And I, you know, could it be better? Sure, but it could be a whole hell of a lot worse. And so I have it pretty good, man. I just, I really just try to have gratitude and perspective every single day for the smallest things because that's the game, man. Like the, the small stuff is the big stuff. And I stay motivated because I feel like I have a gift that I was put in this body, in this era, in this time, and I have this brain, and I can speak this way and think this way, and I've experienced the things that I've experienced, and I made it out the other end. And I feel like it would be selfish of me not to share it and not to be positive and, and lift you guys up and make you have a better day and you know inspire you or motivate you and educate you any way I can. So that's the way that I choose to do it. And just know, man, whether you're out there, anybody listening, like people do depend on you. And people care about you and they give a shit about you and you do make their life and you do make their day better. So by putting your best foot forward and, and trying to, you know, put more good in the world, um, there's a huge cascade and ripple effect that goes on when you do that. And so that's kind of how I tackle it. Next one, timing for carbohydrates. I train fast at 4.45 in the morning and never know the best time to eat. 
honestly depends on the goals. Um, again, we have a podcast uh, talking about when is the best time to eat carbohydrates. Most of you guys probably post workout is ideal sometime after that, maybe an hour, two hours after, depending on you know where you come from. Some of you can extend it a little bit longer. Uh, also pre workout if you need them. If you're an endurance athlete, I would say pre workout is probably ideal too. And then just you know spaced out throughout the day, depending on how much energy you need and what you have to get done. Next one, motivation with extremely busy schedule. Again, I touched on it earlier in a second. And again, if your schedule is busy, really just you know audit your schedule. How much TV are you watching? How much Netflix? How much time do you sit in traffic? How many activities do you do that are really low return? And can you block out 20 to 30 minutes, three to four times a week to work out? I think if you look hard enough, you for surely can. And understand to be motivated from the most basic concept. We're all getting older, softer, and wrinklier, and our hair is gonna turn white or gray or fall out completely. So to think you could go through your life and magically get stronger and more mobile and be healthier and happier and move better without doing the work is a fantasy and a fairy tale. So you have to do that. So just know if you don't do it, you're in a whole world to hurt and there really is no other option. You just have to make time for it. There is really nothing more important than you spending time putting good food in your body and being physically active. You can list me off anything you want um, and I really don't think it trumps that. Next one, women Problem areas, top, rear, thigh, and butt. Been training for four years, no luck tightening that up. Honestly, there's no such thing as you know spot reduction. You can do all the movement patterns you want to strengthen areas, split squat, glute bridges, squats, lunges, all those great things. I would take a hard look at your diet and the food that you're eating. And if you're not tracking macros, I would track macros. If you don't know what you're doing, we have a free guide, hit me up, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, we also coach people, so again, if you guys need a coach, we're happy to be that person for you or find someone locally who can help you. But if you've been working there for four years and it hasn't made a shift and you've really been training and doing a, a program that makes sense, I would imagine it's what you're eating and drinking more often than not. Uh, I really, I couldn't, I can't figure out what else it really could be. Next one, how to eat during the holidays. Do we splurge for a day or try to stay strong? Um, yeah, for sure. Have your fun, man. Live your life. Enjoy, you know, social time with friends and family. Pick your spots in our 50 Days of Fitness Challenge, which is going on right now. We have them pick five days where they kind of just completely tank it. And the other days outside there, we have them, you know, do the best they can. Protein, produce, water, wash, rinse, repeat, and be active every single day. But for sure, you know, on uh, Christmas Eve, uh, we're going to go out with uh, my wife and my mom is coming to town with Dave. So we'll all go out together on Christmas Eve. We'll make Christmas... Uh, Dinner at my house, we'll drink whole foods for that because it, it tastes amazing and it's way easier and, and better than the, the shit that I could make. And then we'll probably pick another day to, to go out and, and treat them and have fun too. So again, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what the holidays are for. Just, you know, you can eat like a, you know, an idiot, but just you can't eat like an idiot every single day. Next one, where can I find your mobility stretches and drills? On our IGTV or our YouTube, we have a full playlist on the Jeremy Scott Fitness YouTube page. It's about 30 or 40 videos of you know mobility foam rolling gua sha uh cupping the whole gamut we have everything on there in detail we're also going to put together an opt-in so we can send you guys the link to it but for now just type in jeremy scott fitness youtube and go to our playlist mobility click it make sure you subscribe to the page by the way so many of you guys who listen here don't subscribe to our youtube and we have almost like a thousand videos on there now all the podcasts are being loaded on there all our mobility stuff a lot of our metcons hit stuff loading stuff and so it's a great free resource that you guys have access to. Next one, working alongside insecure people, business is doing great, so it's hard to leave. Any tips? Insecure in terms of, uh, I guess that would, I guess I would need a little bit more context for that, but you can't really control our people. You can't control what they think, what they do, how they think, how they talk, how they act, and so I would just, you know, ignore them uh, for the most part and just kind of keep it moving. If you have a relationship where you can have an open dialogue with them, I would do that. Otherwise, it's just you not engaging in it and just leading from the front is probably the best example I could give. I don't, I work with insecure people all the time here, but it's typically their own insecurities and I do the best I can to speak to them directly or if we know we have to talk to them with padded gloves on, I tiptoe around it and I just, I try to share quotes and say things and drop you know subliminal hints and uh, just lead uh, by example to, to help them get through it. Next one, would like to listen to your thoughts on balance in life. Personally, I think it's mediocre. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, 
balance, I don't know, man. I, I don't think there is a perfect work-life balance. I don't think there's a perfect balance for anything. I think it's up to each individual to do. I tell you guys all the time, you know, don't train exactly like I train. Don't eat how I eat. Don't wake up when I wake up and sleep like I sleep and don't work like I work. Uh, if you find some of the habits I do can be integrated into your life in a way that they fit your lifestyle, then please do it. But none of you are me and I'm not you guys, so I don't copy what you do. I can take things that you guys say and do and you know, beg, borrow and steal and, and integrate them into my life, but I don't make them my life. And so the balance for me, I have, it works for me right now at this stage of my life for me and my wife um, because I'm on this breakneck pace. This is the most you guys have ever worked in an entire year. I've worked more this year at everything up front and back end and on projects than I even did like I'm probably in year number one just because like we have a goal you know to pay off our house and I'm probably admittedly like maybe four or five payments away total which is pretty fucking awesome because I'm getting real sick of this shit um I always say to enjoy the journey and I've enjoyed it as much as I can but man it's getting real annoying at this point but uh you know to pay off your house uh, this fast and this early in life is, is pretty cool and so um, I have not had a lot of great work-life balance this year specifically because I've been here every day that I'm in town. I've been in this building for probably 10 hours. Most of the days, 11, 12, 13, 14, some 15, 16 hours or 17, which is crazy uh, to do. But it's just a, it's a season of life. And so you just have to understand if you guys are in you know work mode, grind mode, hustle mode, or relaxation mode, just know what season you're in and know where you're at. And I know a lot of the stuff I'm doing today is going to pay off for me the next, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of my life. And I'm not going to have to worry about a lot of the things that average people are worrying about because I just put my head down for the last 12, 13 months to just really do something to set us up financially and just the infrastructure of our business and what we're doing. So after probably about April, May or June of 2020, I'm going to have a whole different take on balance and what I do with my free time and those things. Maybe check back in with me then I can help you guys. What are your current macros right now? Um, for me, I don't know, man. I don't track them. Admittedly, you guys, I eat twice a day, sometimes once a day. Today it's four o'clock on a Friday. I haven't eaten yet. I've been up since four o'clock in the morning. So I'll eat once today. Uh, protein, probably around 200 grams. Sometimes it's probably 220. Sometimes it's probably 187. I don't know. My fats, probably around 100. Uh, most days, some days it's probably 150, some days it's probably 72. And then carbohydrates, you know, some days it can be under 100, some days it can be 400. So hopefully that helps. Again, what I do is not what you guys should do. It works for me in my life. I go by how I feel, number one. If I don't feel good, that's when I make the adjustments. I go by feel. Do I have energy? Do I feel bloated, fat, disgusting, gross? I don't like to feel bad. That's my number one thing. If I have digestive issues, um, you know, discomfort, that's what I kind of gauge off of. What foods am I eating and how is it affecting my body and, you know, how I'm sleeping, how I'm feeling. Do I have allergies? Am I getting sick? Can I go through the workouts? That's what matters most. The aesthetics for me comes down the line. I know that it's probably surprising for a lot of you guys to hear, but I'm not going to sacrifice you know, how I feel on this earth for how I look. I don't give a shit that much. Like, you guys know what I look like. I'm solidified at this point. If I never took my shirt off again in the rest of my life, like, the world's seen plenty of, of me in what I do. So, uh, hopefully that helps answer. Next one. What are your thoughts on dairy? I've had coaches in the past tell me to eliminate it. If you feel good on it, eat dairy products. If it makes you feel bad, don't eat it. If you eat a lot of it and it makes you feel bad, eat less of it. If there's certain dairy products you do like, then eat those. Do I drink dairy milk? No, I don't. Do I eat a ton of cheese? No, I don't. I do love In-N-Out Burger. I do love cheeseburgers. But again, I'm not eating that every single day. I love pizza too, and I rarely get it because again, there's so much dairy and wheat and things in that. It does, you know, kind of set me off and I don't feel great. I do eat cottage cheese on the regular. That's probably the one thing I do do, which is a little bit different in terms of like the casing, the slower digesting, uh, you know, proteins compared to uh, dairy milk, I guess, if you will, and, and other things. But um, if you feel good on it, eat it for sure. No problem. Next one. I'd like to know if you have a workout structure program that's typical training week for you. 100%. 14 damn 1988. 
I have a full podcast titled My Typical Training Routine. You guys can listen to it. Um, in our inner circle group, which is our online uh, fitness community, that's our low barrier, super cheap group to be part of. I share my workouts that I do every single day in there. I share all the workouts we do in the group inside there and a lot of other challenges and stuff we do as well. So yes, you can listen to the podcast and also it's in that group too. Next one. I'm curious about your youth program, how you get kids in the gym to pick fun exercises. as well. That is a great question. Our youth program here, uh, Jacob, my young dude, is the lead coach for that. Um, we talk about it a lot together. We kind of give him free reign on the kids. We just tell him basically, you know, don't lose a kid and don't kill one and we're okay with the rest of it. Um, no, in all seriousness, uh, they go through a lot of, you know, functional movement patterns. They learn how to just move their body through space. We ask them a lot of questions about nutrition. We get them to, you know, a lot of times they want to build obstacle courses. It's really just, you know, having them understand the body, have them move dynamically, and have them look at fitness and training as fun, not punishment. We're not trying to punish them and make them hate it and make them, you know, seem like fitness is something that they have to do. We present it to them like fitness is something that they get to do and they enjoy coming here and doing fun things and they're building community and relationships and they're touching on all the four pillars of fitness. So yeah, obviously there's things we prescribe them because we want them to get it done. And as they get older and if they're doing, you know, things that are more specific geared towards sports, obviously we dig into that. But really, it's just about, you know, making them part of the process and educating them. And obviously with kids, you can steer them in a certain direction and, you know, you can always put your foot down and say yes or no, but that's kind of how we go about doing it. Next one, stress eating. Um, I don't really stress eat. That's not my thing. I, I never was really like that. Sure, once in a while, it'll kind of pop into my brain. But at this point, I've trained myself enough to know that that's only going to make the problem worse. Whatever I'm dealing with, having cinnamon rolls isn't going to fix it, even though in the moment, it seems like it will. Because then all I'm going to do is wake up the next day and have eater's remorse and be like, fuck, that was stupid. And now I still have this horrible problem at work and now I feel bloated and gross disgusting and I can't take a poop and I feel like I weigh 10 pounds more. So that's what I do. I always think of myself the next day. And on a side note, you guys, this is how I think about stress and everything. I always think of myself the next week, the next month, the next year, the next 10 years. And not that I don't live in the moment, but a lot of the decisions I make are predicated on the last 20 years of my life, not, you know, the moment that it's happening. And I think a lot of people would be better off if they did that. I do that with finances. I do that with fitness, with sleep, with a lot of the things that we're doing here. So if you're a victim of that, for you guys, it's you're gonna have to change the culture. You're gonna have to sell yourself on the reason when you're in the store, like why you should buy the right thing and not buy the bad thing. And then in that moment, you have to sell yourself on why giving into the drinks, into the food in the moment is only gonna make the problem worse. I always tell people, visualize you're in a hole that's like three feet deep. And by making those poor eating choices when you're stressed, you're just digging that hole like five feet deeper and now it's that much harder to get out of. And so maybe replacing that habit with a different one is key. But for a lot of you, if you've been doing it for 20 years, it's gonna to be tough to break, man. But you really have to just, you know, dig down and really map out your goals. And that's why I'm a huge visual person and I post, you know, things all over our office that I can see and look at. And that helps me kind of stay the course and reminds me of what I wanna get done. That's why having a coach, a supportive husband or wife, or a, a community like here at Jeremy Scott Fitness. We have accountability groups. We have people who come in here. They cheer each other on. They hold each other up when they're gone. You know, they look for them and we ask them, how you're eating, how you're feeling? And that really does help. So I do think a community and a coach is, is probably key. Next one, self-discipline. Uh, yeah, that comes right hand in hand with the same thing. Really just holding yourself to a higher standard. And you know, if you can do better, do better, you know? And, you know, people always say, like, well, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I'm like, well, if it, if it could be better, it's as good as broke. And it's, I'm always trying to, you know, challenge myself to hold myself to the highest standard. And I view this as a gift that I have in the world. And if I was to not, you know, push the envelope and push the limits, none of you guys would be listening to me right now. You wouldn't see me. You wouldn't hear me. You wouldn't, you know, know anything about me. And so my self-discipline is the thing that allows this machine to run. It's 4 o'clock right now. I'm tired. I'm about ready to fall asleep. But... I promised I would get a podcast out today to myself to help you guys. And so it's just you holding yourself to a higher standard. And like I said, again, if you have a coach 
or a community of people who can help you with that. That is the key. And like, like training the physical body, like you push sleds and do push-ups and pull-ups and squats, it takes time to build up those muscles. And over time, the more disciplined you can be, the more wins you can stack up, the more confidence you're going to have. Next one. Jessica Barber, eating in college. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a tough one too, for sure. Especially if like you're on a budget and you don't have access to a bunch of stuff. Uh, for me, I told the story the other day. I remember like we had this roommate, Crystal, and she was a nursing student. She brought home a, like a sheet cake for like one of her, you know, milestones. She graduated one of her, her courses or passed one of her tests. And there's this huge sheet cake there. And I remember I said, I, I go, there's probably three days in college where I, all I do is eat that sheet cake, drink Mountain Dew and chew tobacco. And that's embarrassing to admit, but that was probably what I did for about three days in a row. Um, again, I was not the healthiest human ever, but don't do that. I guess that's the takeaway. But for you, if you're on a budget, obviously, and you have access to, uh, you know, the school cafeteria and those things, you can always make better choices. Obviously, opting for salads with, you know, a ton of vegetables, the proteins for sure. Obviously, breakfast food is easy for you guys if it's like omelets, if it's eggs, if you can obviously throw veggies in there. But again really just sticking to protein and produce and water is ideal and trying to limit the, you know, the cereals, the breads, the pastas and the junk stuff. Not that you can't integrate them in there, but really just keeping the food as real as you can. I think that goes for anybody, whether you're in college or not. Obviously on a budget, it's harder. Like when you're in a dorm room, you guys don't have access to all the same stuff. And we used to live off of like ramen and Easy Mac. We actually used to take Doritos and crunch them up and throw them into Easy Mac and eat it, which is even worse. Uh, and that was the dumb shit we would do. But if you guys know better, again, obviously do better. So real food, you're always going to regulate better than eating the processed shit. Just for the fact of you don't know a lot of people who eat six bananas in a row. But people eat, you know, six cookies in a row. You don't know a lot of people who are going to eat, you know, a whole bag of carrots at one time. But yet you can easily crush a bag of Cheetos. So I think real food is the key regardless of, you know, the age you're at. Next one. How to trick yourself to stick to a diet Friday through Saturday. Monday through Thursday is easy, but the weekends are harder. I share this all the time with our coaching groups and the phrase I use is, your goals matter just as much on Friday night and Saturday night as they do on Monday morning. Yet for some reason, you have practiced you know, eating well for these four days and you've just said fuck it for these other two days. It's whether it's learned behavior from middle school, high school, college or beyond or because it's a social time with friends and family you feel more relaxed because it's on the weekend. You're not in your same structured routine. Now, obviously, I have the same routine basically every single day. So the weekends for me, they don't deviate that much. Although I do enjoy my cheat meals on the weekends because I do social stuff with my wife or that's just, you know, when I choose to do it. Again, I'm not against that, but it's really just understanding, you know, if it's one or two meals a week, I think it's fine. I really do, as long as those meals, again, like I said, aren't 10,000 calories per meal. I think one or two meals per week is fine for you guys to enjoy yourselves, but just really try to, you know, eat the best you can for the breakfast, and if, that, if you're a breakfast person, your breakfast and lunch are great, and then just enjoy your dinner. But be super active those days, stay super hydrated, get up the next day, I would fat, if you're gonna do two days, I would say fast the next day as long as you can, stay hydrated, you know, and make a better eating choice, you know, proteins, uh, veggies, not, you know, super high fat and crazy carbs. And obviously enjoy that second meal. And then again, the next day when you wake up on Sunday, if that's what it is, do your meal prep, crush the workout and go from it. Sometimes you guys, when you're eating, you know, these shittier meals, you literally can get the benefit, you know, from the overload of the caloric surplus. You can wake up the next day, you guys can crush a workout, maybe do something a little bit longer, go for a longer hike, a longer run, or do like an endurance training or like a terrible met kind of day or some heavy lifting stuff. Um, and you can benefit from it. So don't beat yourself up over it. But again, if you find yourself just like, you know, eating like complete shit fully those two days, really just cut that down and focus, you know, week by week, you know, try to be better uh, than the week before. Next one, how to build arms for women. Uh, well, Wesley, the same as you build arms for dudes. Really, it's all the same shit. Uh, you know, like anything, especially the smaller muscle groups. If you guys are talking like you know, bicep curls and tricep extensions, you know, skull clusters, floor presses, even overhead pressing, you can integrate some of those things into your training program every single day. I don't see for you guys, again, not the same, you know, rep and set scheme, but if you wanna do curls every day, there's no reason you can't do some version of curls every single day, or even like some tricep work every single day, or some shoulder work every single day. Uh, again, I've shared the story before, I did split squats every single day for an entire year. Now I didn't do the same, you know, volume and load uh, and scheme every day, but I mixed it up. And again, 
what's the byproduct? You really start to own a movement and your legs will actually look and feel differently as the year goes on. So hopefully that answers the question. Next one, how to get a bigger chest. Um, obviously, I guess, you know, lift your chest would, would make the most sense for sure. Uh, for you guys out there, if you're training, I would say do upper body stuff at least like twice per week would probably be ideal. Uh, your bench press, uh, all the, you know, flies, all those things are great. The one thing I would say for most of you that would help is just doing push-ups like every single day. Like if you can do, pick a number, whether it's, you know, and for the entire year, and that's why I say I'm gonna go crazy here. So if it's 25 push-ups every day for the entire year, that's great. If it's 50, awesome. Um, if you guys could get up to like 100 at some point as you kind of progress, I think that's fine. Like for me, I one year did my birthday at the end of every single workout. I think it was like 27. So at the end of every single workout, every day for the entire year, did 27 push-ups each day for 365. That would probably be ideal. And again, I would focus you guys not so much on just pushing heavy loads, but time under tension. Really just letting the chest do the work. So it's not a shoulder movement primarily. It's not a tricep movement. You're really just working on the chest, letting it get a nice deep stretch, really just squeezing it. There's so many variations we can go over, but that's you know, my advice right off the top. Next one, what is HIT versus Metcon? Are they the same and how do you do perform either? They are different. I think we touched on this in a podcast already. Short answer, they're both terrible uh, in a good way. I, I don't mean to say that negatively, you guys. I'm a fan of both. Um, but metabolic conditioning and, you know, high intensity interval training are similar yet different. Metcons, you can get a mix. We can do as many rounds as possible. We can do EMOM stuff. Uh, we can do countdowns, we can do ascending, descending patterns. There, there's, we're really not limited with the, the Metcon shit. You can do muscle building focus, we can go kind of fat loss. There's, we can mix and match anything. High intensity interval training is just that. It is high intensity interval training. So when we set up like in as many rounds as possible workout, if we said do five pushups, five squats, 10 jumping jacks and 20 lunges, as many times as you can in 30 minutes, that is not high intensity interval training. There's no intervals there. You follow me? There's no intervals going on. When you do like a Tabata's protocol, right? Like 20 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest. That would qualify as high intensity interval training. So there has to be set rest and set work periods in order for it to be hit training. And for a lot of you guys out there say, well, I'm doing like a, a 50 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest, hit workout. In my opinion, that is not high intensity. You can't physically do that for 50 on 10 off anybody who if you show up to a hit quote unquote class for an hour it is not high intensity it is bullshit because you're bullshitting the beginning the middle or the end or the entire workout looks like trash there's just nobody there's no human who's physically capable of doing that like if you disagree with me email me send me the video i'd love to watch you do a high intensity interval workout for 60 minutes that's a 40 on 20 off and show me minutes 52 through 60. I love to watch the form and the quote unquote high intensity because I promise you, you look like a bag of shit and I promise you, you're about two steps away from death. So again, that would be the difference. Sorry to get on a, a little rant there. Next one. Do you hit the snooze? Uh, maybe sometimes, but only for like three minutes. So I'll go off like one minute, two minutes and the next minute. So I'd turn the alarm off. The next one goes off the next one. But the third one, I just have to get up because I don't have... I don't got time to bullshit. I just have to get up and go. So I don't really have uh, the luxury of doing that. So that's that's how I roll. Next one. Have always been such a driven person or did I have to change my mindset? Nope, I have not always been this way. I'll, I'll take that back. In one or two things in life, I've always been this way. But not as a whole, not as a person. I was a very one-dimensional human uh, when I was younger. So if I go all in on, you know, playing basketball, that's what I would go all in on. If I go all in on like being the best bowler I could be, I would go on it. Typically it was sports related because I sucked at everything else. Um, but I have a podcast that's titled Before I Was Jeremy Scott Fitness. If you listen to that, you'll get the full gist of what my life was like and how broken and fucked up and, and sad it was and, and how I am literally like 179 degree difference. And I say that because I'm not a full 180 because I, I do still do some things from my old life, which I'm happy to do because they made me who I am. And I always am gonna have this kind of chip on my shoulder because of you know, my life and how it's played out and how I grew up. But for the most part, I'm a completely different and 
I am driven just to be now like the best person I could be. Before it was just based on, you know, like accomplishments and achievements. And now it's just really based on me being the best person I can be for, you know, my mom and dad so they can be, you know, proud of the person I am and for my family and for my wife and to lead from the front here to make people here better. That's really what I do. And that's what drives my mindset. Where before it was like, what can I get out of it? And at this point, I don't give a fuck what I can get out of it. I've got everything out of this life that I need. It's what can I do for other people? And then selfishly, if you do it that way long enough, you win the long game and you get way more stuff than you could ever imagine. That's been my experience. Next one. Do I do intermittent fasting? Yes, I do. Every single day for the past 11 years. Haven't missed a day since. Next one. If you're in your 20s, what would you be taking advantage of right now? Um, in terms of fitness, I would train upper body twice a week, heavy, lower body twice a week, heavy. And heavy is in relative terms. I just mean lifting, you guys, not crazy heavy. Uh, I'd be doing some form of conditioning. I'd be doing mobility every single day, getting awesome sleep, not abusing drugs or alcohol. And in terms of the world, I would be just crushing Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, Tumblr, blog posting, podcasting all day long. And I would, before I would do that though, I'd really master my craft. Before I would start pumping out a bunch of stuff, I would really just study and do the best I could and learn as much as I possibly could and get as many awesome mentors and surround myself by really smart, awesome people. And before I even put out one stitch of fucking content, I would just really make sure I was good at my craft and what I did and I would make sure what I was saying made sense and I would ask myself, hey, in 10 years from now, if I listen to this, is this gonna be something I wanna stand by and live by? And that's how I'd engineer it. Next one, do you have a favorite place to eat and hang out that's budget friendly when I go out? For sure, um, hit me up if you got a question. We have a restaurant guide here for, for Scottsdale locally or if you guys come visit. My wife and I have been to all the nicest places because she, what she does for work, it's been amazing and she's way more versed and educated than me and she can prescribe stuff that's has a, a great atmosphere, an ambiance, um, or what other words does she use? It's, you know, it's so, you know, chic. It's so um, cozy. She uses all these little buzzwords. I don't use any of them. I just care if the food's good. I don't give a shit. And the service. The service matters to me. Uh, and if the food's good to me. It could be served in somebody's garage for all I care. If the food was great and the service was awesome. But again, we can help out with that uh, a ton. Next one. About ketogenic diet. Um, we have a whole podcast on keto if you guys want to listen to it in detail uh, and go from there. Next one. Uh, plant-based diet. Again, we have a whole podcast on the Netflix documentary Game Changers where I share my two cents on you know what I think about plant-based diets as a whole. Cliff Notes version, I think you guys should uh, eat more plants for sure, but I don't necessarily think that eating all vegan is ideal for you guys. Next one, how to lose your belly pooch. Um, macros, track your macros, beat a calorie deficit, be patient, give it time. Uh, train hard, get quality sleep, don't stress. That's the quickest way to uh, to lose fat. Not just in your belly, but, but anywhere in your body for sure. Do, what's this one? Your thoughts on overtraining. Yes, I do think it's possible. Do I think most people do it? No, I don't. I think they under recover, they under sleep, they over stress and they eat like shit and they drink too much. But there are the rare people who do do way too much exercise. And what I would say is this, as you get older, there's only, as my, my friend BJ Gador says, there's only so many fitness checks you can cash. So I'd be really mindful of, of what you're doing and how much wear and tear and damage it does to your knees, hip, ankles, and shoulders, and your spine. And really just try to make light loads go a long way and really be mindful of your rest and recovery because it's just as important. Because when you're in the gym, that's the, you know, the demo. You're deconstructing, you're breaking the body down. When you eat and when you sleep and you go home, that's when the repair and the recovery and the growth happens. So without that, you're really just spinning your wheels, man. You can't always be in, you know, demo mode. You can't always be breaking the body down. You have to give it the proper rest and recovery. And you have to plan for that. And that really is important. So yes, overtraining is a thing. Next one, protein shake after, during the workout or skip the shake and keep the fast. Really depends on the goals. If you feel you need to have a shake post-workout, then have it. Um, if you can keep the fast going and fat loss is the goal, I don't see the major downfall as long as you're getting in a decent amount of protein every single day. Odds are your body's gonna probably pull from the food you ate from the day before, so I think you are okay. So again, no wrong answer. If you wanna have a protein shake post-workout, cool. I don't, um, I tend to just stick with real food, but again, I think either direction is totally cool with me. Next one, how to start training and stay on track even 
when you don't know why you do it? Um, I don't really know how to answer that. Obviously, you're doing it for you know health and for happiness and to move better and feel better and look better and for longevity. And so you're just not, you know, a broken down, immobile bag of shit your whole life. So um, you just do it because you care about yourself, like because you give a fuck about yourself. That's how you stay on track because nobody else cares as much as you do and they shouldn't. And nobody else is going to wake you up and motivate you and push you and make you squat and make you train hard. You just have to care about your body and your health and your results. And I don't see how this is the thing. And I'm not trying to get at anybody here, but you just have to care about yourself enough. This is your body, you guys. You get one. This is fucking it. This is not a dress rehearsal. This life is never coming back again. You are going to die and this will be over. So why not live it in the healthiest, happiest, most mobile, badass, sexiest body you possibly can? If you have a debate for me, I'm happy to talk on that, but you, you really should just care about yourself. Like sometimes, you know, the most unselfish thing you can do is be selfish and make you the best version of you and everybody else will reap the benefits. So it is not selfish by dedicating time to train and eat and sleep and take care of yourself both physically and mentally. And on that note, spiritually and emotionally, those things all matter. And the last one I'm gonna leave you guys with real quick, what is it here? How to control ourselves and not break up a good routine. Um, you know, it's really just knowing what your goals are and knowing why you're doing it. And that's why I always say it can't just be vanity based and it can't just be based on how you look. And a lot of people, that's how it starts and that's fine. But that's not gonna keep you going, man, because nobody really cares what you look like. And I'm not saying that in, in a bad way. Like, my wife, if I gain 20 pounds, my wife's not gonna leave me. If I lose 20 pounds, my wife's not gonna leave me. And same thing for her. If she feels more comfortable at 20 pounds heavier and she wants to deadlift and squat heavy and be like the strongest, you know, woman on earth, like I'm all for it. And if she wants to lose, you know, 10 pounds and she feels more confident there and it's if it was healthy for her to do, I'm okay with it. And she wasn't crazy and didn't go nuts. Like, but again, I don't give a shit. It's up to her and what she would feel confident with. And it's, again, it's up to me, like what I feel comfortable doing. So nobody really cares, you guys, at the end of the day, what your body fat is, what your weight is, what you look like. And if you have a husband or wife or spouse who is really critical of you, you need to have an open conversation with them. And if they're not willing to change that, you need to fucking get out. You really do. And I'm not trying to get real serious here before we go, but that's the reality of it. You need to be doing this for you. And you have to be realistic with what you look like and how you feel. And you really just have to be happy with where you're at today. And you can work to improve the things that you don't love about yourself just yet, but you can't be overly critical. And you have to just really care. Like you have to know this is the only option. You have to get good sleep, you have to exercise, and you have to eat good, period. Like there's no, there's nothing else. There's no magic program, no magic pill, no video, no nothing I can share with you. This is just the game. It always is and it always has been. Like you just really have to just go all in on that and know like you're gonna have stumbles and falls and slip ups and you might have some peaks and valleys, but you just have to make it non-negotiable. It's not, I should work out and I should eat right, Fuck that. It's I must work out. I must eat right. I must take care of myself. I must get good sleep. And if I don't, I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to suffer. I'm not going to be as healthy. I'm not going to be as happy. I'm the one who's going to struggle. It affects you more than anybody else. So hopefully that answers the question. So I'm exhausted. I need to eat. I need to go to sleep, take a nap, hang out, chill with my dog, hang out with my wife, do some normal stuff. So Hopefully you guys enjoyed that Q&A. There was a lot of questions to get through. I thank you guys for that. Hopefully I provided you with as much value as possible in there and I answered everything. If I didn't, you guys shoot me a message. I'm happy to record if I can speak on it real quick. If you're on iTunes right now, stop. Don't be a lazy ass. Scroll down on your iPhone on the podcast app. Drop me a five star. Type in a comment. It takes about 25 seconds. If you're on your MacBook or you have an iPad, click the iTunes icon, do the same thing, ratings and reviews, click at a five star, leave a comment. I truly would appreciate it. And if you think this podcast can help any friends or family or any of the episodes for that matter, please share it along. And again, if you are looking for something more specific, scroll through the titles or DM me or email me directly and say, hey, Jeremy, have you done a podcast on this? 
I'm happy to do some of the legwork for you and shoot it to you because I give a shit about you guys that much. If it can help you live a little bit better life, I'm willing to take the time out of mine to help yours. So, um, anything else, you guys let me know. Otherwise, I'll probably be back tomorrow or Sunday with another episode. And until next time, eat well, train hard, be nice to people, and please, you guys, just keep doing shit you love with people you enjoy because your life is too short not to. I'll talk to you guys soon. Peace.